Thank you, Dr. Plexus. You have honored me by allowing me to interview my own teacher, who is an uh, expert in the field of urology and who is practicing urology for the past three or four decades. And, um, sir, uh, what do you think? Uh, what is the commonest uh, uh, tumor or a cancer you come across in urology, the field of urology? Well, I. The commonest tumor in, in my practice is the bladder cancer. Um, interestingly, we feel that most patients are smokers and that is true. But uh, I do see uh, some of them who are not smokers. I also see it in women. And we know that in some parts of India, women smoke and there are some women who do smoke. But uh, there are some women who don't smoke. And I'm finding that in the older age population, 80-year-old uh, women are coming with hematuria and there's a small papillary tumor in the bladder. So it's, it's there and uh, it's possible that there may be an infective focus which has triggered it off or some other carcinogen which we have no idea about. But in my practice, as I said, bladder tumor is the most commonest urological cancer that I've seen. What are the important or uh, classical... Uh uh, the symptoms or the patient will approach the urologist uh, which will uh, ask him to get the opinion from the urologist. If you well, there is no doubt that it's the fact that they see blood in the urine. And it worries people when blood comes in the urine because blood from any part of the human body will make any patient run to seek medical attention. And interestingly, in the vast majority of patients, this bleeding that happens in the urinary tract as a result of bladder tumors is painless. So, on the one hand, it's a double-edged symptom because, because he's got no pain, he doesn't pay heed to it. He forgets it. He says, oh, there's no pain, blood. On the other hand, he has seized the blood and he's got no pain and he also wonders, oh, I'm seeing blood. The very fact that he's seeing blood makes him calm. So, it's painless, but there's bleeding. And some of them will definitely have clots. If we ask them, do they pass clots in the urine? They say, yes, they will pass some clots in the urine. So this is the single most important symptom that uh, will make the patient come to the... And uh, what is a incidence of urinary infection in both uh, either male or female, uh, which in, is common in females? Why it is more common in females? Well, uh, we know that statist uh, statistically speaking, that uh, women are prone to getting at least two or three episodes of lower urinary tract infection, what we commonly call cystitis, in their lifetime. Every woman. And uh, either it happens immediately after they get married, which is, uh, you know, called in urological parlance uh, honeymoon cystitis, because that's the first time they are exposed to a sexual act and that itself will trigger a urinary infection and which is very disturbing and very scary because they've never had this problem before and it spoils a very uh, par important part of the marriage life early on. So, cystitis is there and women are certainly more prone to getting cystitis. There are many reasons for this and uh, the most common reason is the fact that there is a problem with some women with the bladder lining. The bladder lining is impervious to everything. It's, it's totally, it's probably the only waterproof barrier we have in the human body. And the bladder lining is what gets defective. And then the E. coli, which is the commonest bacteria in this situation, is very close by because of the perianal vaginal contamination which occurs. Uh, unfortunately, in the female, the anal orifice is pretty close to the vagina. The and the anatomy makes it more conducive for these E. coli, which are normal pathogens in the stool, to sort of walk their way inside. The other reason is that uh, many uh, the, the urethra of the female is much shorter. So, they are more prone to get it. The sexual act itself is claimed to be a sort of a massaging influence on the bacteria and pushes them towards the, uh, towards the urinary, urinary bladder. bladder. 
And last but not least, as women attain menopause, the lining of the urethra becomes more inelastic, rigid. The urethra shortens because of the lack of estrogens and that makes them again more prone to getting infection. The most important thing we need to remember is that the bacteria E. coli has got fimbria. It has got tentacles. So, it just sticks on to the bladder wall and come what may in some of these women, it does not wash away. So, they keep getting recurrent episodes of cystitis which is very unnerving. So, this is the commonest uh, cause of infection and the reasons as I have just enunciated. Yes, sir. But is it curable, this urinary tract infection, especially middle-aged women or… Well, as long as it is confined to the bladder, it is curable. Some women get only one episode, never to get it again. Some women may get two or three episodes. But in my practice, I ask the lady if she is getting more than five episodes in a year. That means every other month she's got infection, she's got symptoms, it's bugging her and uh, she has to run to the toilet, she has to have off work if she's a working woman or if she's a housewife, then she's laid up in bed. So, all these things are issues. So, in that situation, as long as it is confined to the bladder, then I would step in to treat on a long term basis. I think we need to make a distinction between the infection which occurs in the bladder and that which occurs in the kidney. The one that's in the kidney is a very dangerous infection. Uh, pyelonephritis. Some women do get it, uh, but we know that some of these patients could have diabetes. And diabetes could be the first, you know, pyelonephritis could be the first manifestation of diabetes in any of these women. So, we need to be careful of that. It does not mean that you have to be an older woman. We are seeing patients who are 35, 40 now women with their first episode of pyelonephritis and they have high blood sugars. So, I think we need to be aware of this fact that diabetes, as everybody says, is the commonest medical problem that is afflicting the Indian population or the Asian population in particular. So, we need to make a distinction between the upper tract and the lower tract infection. Sir, it is, uh, I feel very happy and proud to say that you have got your own mark in the field of reconstructive urology. And uh, what is your, um, the, I mean in your career, what is the level of incidence of this uh, uh, trauma cases or trauma patients in the urology fields? Because of our increased mobility, there is a higher incidence of accidents, number one. Number two, because of our total lackadaisical attitude to safety, I am talking of construction workers, I am talking of the way people travel in our country without any regard for safety men. People travel in bullock carts, people sit on a bullock cart and they will fall over. People are doing construction work and they fall, they are no harness. Children will be jumping over certain things and you know uh, fences and stuff like that and they get injured in the bulba urethra. The toilets in the villages are not at home, they are all outside. So the patients have to walk to the toilet in the night and there are manhole covers on, they don't see all that or they have a stone and they trip and they fall and a simple injury if it hits you in the perineum as far as the male is concerned then you could land up with a urethral injury. These high speed accidents and other types of uh, heavy, I mean uh, serious uh, accidents destroy the pelvis, they break the pelvis bone and the urethra is very closely related to the pubic bone. So, if you have a bad accident, there is a high chance that you could actually injure your urethra concomitantly as a result of that. Let us not feel that only men are prone to this, women also can get injured, women also can have get involved with these accidents, can fracture their pelvis and they can injure their urethras. Although the urethra is reasonably protected in the woman, it can still be subject to injury and that is a very, very more devastating injury for the woman because she will be leaking urine due to the anatomy. So, it is a different thing altogether. Uh, so, the incidence is there and we know that patients are getting injured uh, and as a result of which they are affected, the urethra gets damaged. So, that is the model. If the urethra is damaged in a badly manner and if you have uh, the chance of getting repaired and coming back to the normal routine life, what is your uh, uh, opinion sir regarding that? Well, I think, you see the thing is most of these people are young. They are young men and as a result of the injury and the accident if it causes the injury, two issues happen to them. One is the urethral trauma and the other is the erectile dysfunction. So, two it is a double, double whammy for them, They both times they get injured. So, the urethra has to be fixed. They are young, they need to be passing urine if possible through the urethra like every other man and they need to get their erectile function sorted out. Many of them are unmarried 
and uh, it's a main concern. You may fix the urethra, but they will all come back to you because they get erectile, they have got erectile dysfunction. So you have to treat both these components, and uh, we should try to repair the urethra if possible. Sometimes it may fail in one go; it may have to have two or three goes. But our aim should be that in these younger people, that we should try and conserve the urethra, preserve it, and protect it, and repair it so that they are able to pass urine. Having said that, once they are treated and they are cured of the urethral stricture, then the attack has to come on the erectile function. There are very ways by which this can be treated, either with simple with drugs or with rehabilitation techniques or uh, implants, prostheses. These are things which are there uh, to treat these younger men. I think in the field of uh, modern urology, you may be able to achieve these goals so that you can provide a I mean, if not uh, good, uh, it is a reasonably a decent life for an young patient. I, I think so. I think so. I think uh, in my own practice, we have been able to rehabilitate uh, a fair number of young men. The biggest problem I find is that while the urethral part can be fixed, when it comes to actually tackling erectile dysfunction and the other conservative methods like PD5 drugs or you know the vacuum erection device or even the papaverin injection fails, they need a penile processes. And the only cheaper variety of process that we have is uh, sharp processes, which is reasonably priced. But even then, patients want something that is imported. Nobody wants made in India. Everybody wants made in USA or made somewhere else. And this is hellish expensive. So for the average Ahmadmi, uh, spending about 2.8 lakhs or 3 lakhs for a penile processes uh, can be a problem. And many of them just uh, try to make do with whatever it is. And I think they suffer. And they are in a deep state of depression. And I know quite a lot of young men who are extremely depressed only because of the fact that they have got erectile function. They can't get married or this fact is hidden. They get married and then there is a separation. So, this is a serious issue as far as I am concerned. It is a mystery of the yes, individual. Yes. It is my privilege and pleasure. I have asked questions to my own teacher and probably this may throw some light on for the common man in the field of urology. Thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Mayapan for the opportunity and to Dr. Plexus for this. To stay updated on our latest scale videos and interviews, please follow us on Twitter, like us on our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy Doc Plexing!